Okay, so if I hand over straight to Christoph to introduce yourself properly. No worries at all. Thank you for having me. And um, just to sort of expand a little bit on uh, sort of the points that were just made, one of the things I always find when um, I speak to coaches or players or even other referees is that in the meetings, we always think we need to come to a definitive outcome as to is it a yellow card? Is it a red card? Um, is it a high tackle? And it, re it reflects how great the game is because even in our referees meetings, we don't always come to a, a, a clear, decisive outcome on, on what we would all consider to be really big decisions. Um, and that's because the game is great and the game is all up for interpretation. So what I think is, is a high tackle will be different to what Chris thinks is a high tackle or Scott or Bruce. They, we will all slightly differ um, in terms of our interpretation of what should and shouldn't be a penalty, what should and shouldn't be a yellow card. And so I think the best we can do on these calls is, is try get closer together as coaches, referees, as to understanding why you coach what you coach and why we referee what we referee and making sure there's not a divide, but we've, we've almost got an understanding as to, okay, I might not agree with that decision, but I can understand why the picture that my players presented has led to him making that decision. Um, so how can we coach uh, that, that sort of clear out better? How can we paint a better picture or has the referee just made a, a mistake? And so we move on and park that and keep doing what we're doing. And they're all choices you make as, as coaches. And then that's where we need to be really good as referees is to make sure we aren't making those errors. So, sorry, just quick introduction as well. Um, my name is Christoph Ridley. I, I referee in the premiership now. I've uh, refereed in European rugby. Um, I've been a professional for five, six years. I was an injured player. So the choice was to coach, which I did for two years, or sort of get goaded into refereeing where I was promised there were great opportunities. And lo and behold, there have been, to be fair. Um, so it was a good choice to join the dark side. And, and I've sort of really enjoyed it and hopefully embraced it a little bit. And it's gone pretty well over the last couple of years. So um, as far as I'm concerned, that's all I can really say for now. But I think once we get the clips rolling, please ask questions and, and be challenging um, with your questions. Like, I'm not precious. I'm happy for you to um, sort of say, why is this always happening? I don't understand how this is, is, is not picked up because I'm positive we would have thought about it because we talk about these things day in, day out. It's full time now for English refs, Welsh refs, Scottish, Irish. This is something that we live and we breathe. It's not something we turn up to at the weekend just to do a, as a hobby anymore. So the, the more sort of robust conversation we can have, I think we can draw out those niggles that you might have when you watch rugby on the TV. And it might be, mean you can take stuff back to your clubs, which just mean it adds value to what you're coaching and what your players are playing. So hopefully this hour will be valuable. So that's about all I've got to say, if that's all right. Perfect. Thank you, Christophe. Right, everybody, let's get cracking into uh, some clips. So I picked out um, a, a, a few different uh, a few different stages of, of the contact area. Um, so carrying the contact, um, body language of, uh, of first support players, second support players. We look uh, some bits in there on the jackler and then the tackler and how, how that's influenced. Um, and I suppose the final thing I should say is I picked out clips because of things I've seen. You will see other things as well. Chris will see other things. So please do feel free to check in different thoughts um, and then we'll get a more rounded perspective. So clip number one. Uh, this was the semi-final Bristol against Tigers. Take that back again. Just play that through relatively slowly for you. So ball carrier. And this the reason I saw that. Uh, this one stood out for me is just uh, the change in interpretation this year with players and what they're allowed and not allowed to do on the floor. So tackle has been made, falls one way, and then turns uh, and places back the, the other. Um, and of course, 12 months ago uh, or 18 months ago, players were rolling out, out of that contact. Christoph, do you want to just offer a little bit of insight there as to maybe why, why that uh, interpretation changed and, and kind of where the line is that, that you would see? Yeah, so the, the World Rugby wanted to improve um, two parts to the game. So one of them was safety. So 
what they felt was that we were forcing jacklers to spend too long on the ball before giving them a reward. So Wild Rugby said, if these guys get on the ball and they pull, lift the ball, we need to be giving reward quicker. And the reason they wanted that is because the longer we were leaving them hanging there, they were in a vulnerable position and we were getting late clearers coming in from a distance. And that's where you were getting your big collisions, your injuries at breakdown. So one point for the change was to protect the players. The other point was to make sure that there is a contest because we started to lose that contest slightly. So mm. we wanted teams to have the ability to go in and steal the ball and get turnovers. Um, so there was a balance between protecting players and, and improving the contest in the game. And that's why the double role has ended up coming in as well. I mm. think this one is, is really marginal. Um, in my view, it, you can almost argue that he, he does that one placement and that although he lands on his left shoulder, he's still entitled to turn the other way to place. Mm-hmm. Um, it's different to rolling to gain ground or rolling to deter that contest for the jackler. But I'd be really interested in what the other coaches think on this one. Yeah, thoughts, everybody? Play on. Yeah, I, I, agree. Well, you know, I agree with Christoph there. I think that's a, that's a marginal call at best. Um, you know, technically speaking, yet he's landed on that shoulder and he's rolled. But uh, I mean, the uh, the uh, tackler or the tackle assist, sorry, didn't go in for a poach. That had no bearing on the game. I, I would have let that play on. Yeah, it, it was played on in the game just to give you a guide, okay. everybody. Um, and uh, this is also a behavior that I coach fairly actively. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the the uh, hip uh, movement itself. I'm hoping this might be reassuring to coaches. And I mean, I I can't guarantee this happens at all levels, but certainly at at the sort of top level, we, there's things we consider with the double roll. So we're not look, we're not desperately searching for players who are rolling, taking an extra roll on the floor. There's other boxes we're looking to tick. If that player, the ball carrier is isolated, then our awareness needs to be heightened because he's far more likely to be, trying to buy time if he's found himself isolated. If the tackle is dominant and he's gone backwards, again, he's going to be looking to buy time. So we are trying to read that sort of balance of power in the game. And when you get this scenario, so the the ball carrier, he's probably won that collision. The tackle is fine, but it's certainly not dominant. And the clear out is there immediately with the hooker supporting. So that these aren't the ones we're going for because the contest was probably never there in the first place. Um, Mm -hmm. Had the hooker not been there and the ball carrier is isolated, you might actually go after this decision because Mm -hmm. the likelihood of seven contesting the ball, if there's no supporting clearer there is completely different. Um, So that's just something I'm not confident all coaches at all levels are aware, but that's the sort of stuff we are thinking about is where is the balance of power? Are there supporting players? Is he isolated? And they are key triggers for us as to whether or not we do or don't make a decision. And that's really useful. Cool. Thank you, Ferguson. Um, Right into a second one, which which builds on that somewhat. So I've got two angles for this one. The Raging Bull, Nathan Hughes. Take that back to a different angle. So we've got ball carrier behaviours initially, and then there's next supporting players are things that that stood out for me, and I think this angle helps with that bit as well. So um, kind of things that I'd be kind of actively coaching that that are on show. Shoulders forwards. So ball carrier, shoulders forwards and chest forwards, and then falling forwards. So that's something that I would would coach actively. in terms of uh, then tackler behaviours, we'll talk about that one in a moment and kind of things the tacklers do to uh, to influence the contact area. But next arriving players, uh, Christoph, what, what kind of things would you be looking for? So uh, Dan Thomas in next. So my absolute priority here is still Harry Wells, who's the Leicester player on the floor on the wrong side. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm really not that interested in where yellow scrum cap from the white team enters here because if he does come in from the side, I'm going to blame the player lying on the wrong, the player who's just lost that tackle collision. Um, and a lot of the time when players say to us, if, if we were to end up uh, penalising this player on the wrong side, he looks at us and goes, what do you expect us to do? I, I think a lot of the time the answer is well, you've got to do better in the tackle. Nathan Hughes has just run over the top of you. You've ended up on the wrong side. 
no one's pinning you, but you are having an impact on those clearers coming in through the gate. So although this is play on for everybody, I'm sure this is play on mm -hmm. um, a priority for a referee here should always be that tackler first. So once that tackler moves, then I'll look at attacking players. But whilst he's there, in the way of that attacking clearer entry, I'm not really interested in what they're up to at this point. Cool, thank you. Um, so just some of those coaching points, a couple of things to pick up on is when Nathan Hughes' shoulder square, he's scoring a try going forwards. I always use that analogy of scoring a try. Uh, so he wants to get long because he wants his momentum going forwards. Interestingly, the tackler also wants him to be long because he's in a better position for a jackal to come over. But then Nathan's work on the floor his hips move forwards, shoulders move back, his legs are pretty much where they were. So what we would have coached probably five or six years ago, the jackknife is is right back in fashion um, as, as a as a functional position. Uh, and then next arriving players, this, this is the bit that I suppose stood out is, um, what are you looking for in terms of hand position, Jürgen Christoph? So Dan Thomas comes over the top, he then goes hand on the floor, hand on the body. Yeah, what, are, so what are you looking for? Again, we go back to the sort of philosophy I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, is there a player there to compete in the first place? There, there's so many arriving players all in support. So the contest is never on. So they're not the off feet we're going after. The off feet we're going after is where they are going off feet to completely stop that contest because there's a threat. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the latchers who go off feet and make no effort to get back up on, onto their feet. It's the... Uh, isolated ball carriers and the first arriving player just dives straight off his feet because he's desperate. It's the supporting player who overruns the breakdown and then takes a shortcut and just seals straight over the ball. Mm. They're the off feats we're going for. So again, this is too marginal. There's no contest anyway. So it, it just doesn't have an impact on the game. It doesn't matter. Um, although if we look at technicalities, some people will say he's off his feet. So for him to be on his feet, Christoph, if, if you go like a letter of the law, where, where would uh, what would Dan Thomas and Harry Thack have to do to be on feet? I think this. I don't think there's a referee in the world that would penalise these for off feet. So I'd have to say they're on their feet. Um, and if a referee does penalise them for off feet, I, I promise you he won't have a good game just on the basis of consistency. Because if he blows every one of these and the players don't adapt, there's, two, there's going to be 200 penalties in the game. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and obviously, we want that flow, don't we? Um, yeah, so again, kind of coaching points-wise, things that I'd be picking out coaching-wise uh, is arm around the waist, kind of uh, like, like a flanker binding onto a scrum. In fact, I've just been coaching that for the last hour or so. Uh, and then split stance. So both players in a relative split stance, even wide split stance on the right side particularly as the backup player, just to give a, a bit of weight behind the uh, behind the first ceiling player. Uh, into our next one. Feel free to ask questions, by the way, everybody. Uh, I'll pause after this next clip uh, regardless. Okay, this one's a slightly wider angle. Hopefully it works okay. Uh, the TV um, angle didn't work so well, so I went for the wide instead. So uh, just a little bit of thought about ball carry actions and then first supporting player and then tackler behaviours. Go back again. Hopefully that comes up clear enough here. I'll show you that. Show you that again. But I'll do it in relative slow mo. So just uh, if you can have eyes just off the ball. And then tackler in the tackle area. And then supporting players. So in terms of um, kind of coaching wise, it is not not uncommon for uh, the off the ball players to be influencing the next the next player. Um, which uh, so in terms of law, Christoph, is that uh, just part and parcel of just the flow of the game or an illegal act? I, I, I've really heightened my awareness to this, and again, this comes back to the importance of refs and the best referees in the world will get a good read on this. If it's a dog woo who's slightly checked. Now, 
I, I don't think it has an impact at all on his ability to support this breakdown. I don't think he would have been in, in any better position. If anything, he may have even overran it had he not have been checked slightly. So it might even do him a favour. But we, we do have awareness of these guys getting checked. If he gets checked properly and he gets stopped and then the ball carrier ends up isolated, Curry then comes in on the ball, I think you then have to penalise it and mm -hmm. say that the support players were taken out off the ball. Now, that takes that takes some pretty good refereeing to be able to spot that, but you've just got to clock it. And, and, and we have heightened our awareness to that. So if he gets checked, ball carrier isolated, and then there's a potential turnover, I think you have to penalise the check. Mm -hmm. If this happens and he's not really impacted and you get some good momentum, then the tackler might be on the wrong side. Then the attack, the support player might be off his feet. This is one of those scenarios where there are so many things happening. Sometimes play on is just the best option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true enough, true enough. Uh, so take Curry in this, uh, for this next bit. So my thought here is, where's the gate? That, that would be side entry for me. Yes. Um, and, and the reason I say that, and it's a bit of a selfish reason, if you give players really easy reward for turn, I, I want to reward players who get in a good position, they lift the ball, and I'll give them a, a, the reward for holding on. But if you give players cheap reward like this, where Curry isn't first man there, he's probably third man after Faf, Faf and Adogwu, he has no rights to that ball whatsoever. If you give him that reward, you are telling every player on that pitch that if you are second, third arriving player, you can have a bite at the cherry. And I can, I, I can assure all referees out there that, that this will cause a chaotic game if you tell Curry and reward Curry here because everyone is then going to have a pop at the ball. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing an advantage against Curry here just because I think he's testing the water. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, I, I think we can all agree, even co coaches, he's not first man. He's got no rights to that ball, um, even, even before the fact that he might be in the side. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. Um, one of the things, I suppose, from a coaching perspective, that these type of things stand out for is you think with the, the breakdown practices the coaches often do, they're kind of quite sanitary, uh, kind of 3v3 or 2v2 and uh, everybody's coming forwards, whereas this is something we've got to help players get really good at, which is tracking back and then coming through the gate with somebody already in the way who's not going to contest, he's just there to uh, invite maybe. Um, so I think coaching practice-wise, Getting lots of those type of scenarios helps those players to understand the, the gate and so on. And, and just, just one thing from some sort of, I think, from most referees' point of view is when you get a really talented player and you'll have them in your teams who are um, sort of as good as Curry is, and we all know Curry is one of the best uh, turnover players I I in the world, they've got to make good choices because this is a really silly penalty to give away. If he does, and then you then you're you're getting you're painting that picture for the referee that you're not you're not painting good pictures essentially. And I, I just think for someone like Curry, if I was coaching him, I, I would be showing him this clip saying, "You're so good at what you do, you need to make smarter choices because you're not this desperate. Um, you you can, you will get two, three, four turnovers in this game. This is not one of them. You're never going to get this turnover. So why take the risk?" Yeah, yeah, no, totally agree. Um, it also, it, oh, sorry, just it also encourages like in the second, two seconds after that, a wasp player comes in from the side as well, doesn't he? Because he sees Curry's gone in, and he's got a hand on the ball, and then yeah. in he comes and <laughs> just yeah. just takes him out at, at the same time. So, it, yeah, I think absolutely, it's he's naughty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> interesting. The, the referee language is uh, talking with the role in a way. I was interested the fact that Curry comes into that maybe heightens awareness of the player on the floor. So there's a sort of warning of the player on, on the ground. Uh, and then this is just, just a few minutes later. I'll play this through a little. I, I, did anyone notice the check by eight sale there? I, I, that almost had an impact. And if that led to a turnover, I would have penalised eight sale. Um, it'll be good to go back on that at the end of this clip. Yeah. The eight sale wasn't 
was trying to do it a bit more subtly as such. He wasn't like yeah. holding, was he? Like the other one, he, he wasn't, but he had more checked, of an impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. He checked his back, he sort of turned to make it look a bit and, less and subtle. The, as... And the jackler gets on the ball, I think. There's all, you almost get that turnover. So this is the one that I think you've got to spot as a ref because if they turn it over, that one there, if they turn it over there, that first jackler in, I, I, I think you might need to penalise that. What do mm -hmm. coaches think about that? Is this deliberate play? Do you think it's a ploy? It's the second time we've seen them do it. Seems pretty deliberate. He's just trying to do it subtly without just just getting in the way, isn't he? Just trying to buy the second or two for the jackler, I think. Really, just been quite smart, really. But, you know, as a defensive side, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it was definitely intentional. The, these um, these clips, by the way, the, the way that I've linked <laughs> these together is that. Uh, Max Rookies all the way through is talking to Sale for their um, tackler behaviours and off the ball behaviours, and, he, and he's warning them every wreck. So um, we're seeing that happen. Clearly, see nipples available. Next one, tackler just holding on, holding on to legs just for a moment longer, keeping the legs long. Jackler getting in, probably off feet as well. Jackler, yeah. And then it's kind of like the last straw, then the penalties, then no clear, no clear release. So kind of a, um, a build up of the picture. So how does that, do you, do you find that's the case with yourself, Christoph, where kind of that picture is built over a period and yeah. there's going so, to be a penalty at some point? So you have to set games up well now as a referee. So whenever I go into te games, especially teams like Sale, who have so many threats, um, on the ball, off the ball, so many jacklers. I know that if I don't set up that breakdown and set some really clear parameters, that they are going to cause and wreak havoc the whole game um, with with breakdowns like this. And and this is really tiring to referee rugby like this as a referee because you got check off the ball, you got jackler in, and you don't want to reward him because of the check. You've then got the uh, off feet jackler. There's, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and the tackler holding in here, there as well. So early in a game, first 15, 20 minutes, I want to set the game up by making decisions. So I would, if this was the first 10 minutes, I would penalise the player who bumps in off the ball. I would then penalise Curry for going off feet here. And then I'd penalise the player for not releasing at the next breakdown. And I'd be really clinical in how I refereed that in the first 10, 15. And the best teams, teams like Sale, will adjust. They'll change around you. Um, they're well coached and you know with all the coaches on here as well it, it's it's almost more the player responsibility to adapt to the ref than it is the ref to the players purely because it's very difficult for a referee to adapt to 30 people but it's pretty simple for everyone to adapt to that ref not most of the time as long as the ref is consistent cool thank you um, so just to add a couple of kind of coaching points and things that these players are definitely being coached to do is uh, tackle, but when tackle is completed, squeeze, um, like a second squeeze, you call it. Um, so ball carriers has gone to the ground, second squeeze to stop them from moving properly. And that allows the jackler then to get straight back in. And then the flip side would be ball carrier when you've been, if you're being squeezed or if you fall, when you've fallen long, snap your hips back uh, and get them back, back into position. Um, obviously, Curry there has gone shoulders and head pretty much straight to the floor, isn't he? Okay, I'm going to stop that just there and then open up to coaches for a moment. So uh, any uh, particular questions that come to mind, coaches, if I give you a minute or two. Christoph, just so when at international level, obviously, over the last three weeks and and i guess i've known for a while that obviously dor's international level meet with referees before a game and go through all of that and we've had that whole business with with all that's gone on in that line series in the premiership is it just a normal league weekend you don't have those discussions or you would have those discussions is there a pre-game meet or phone call video chat and then an after game or how, how does that process so, yeah. um, so there's a window where the coaches can contact us. It's usually on a Thursday. Um, so any time on a Thursday afternoon, either team can give us a call. Um, and 
I'll be honest, the culture in the, in the premiership is fantastic. So we had a call professional referees and all the DORs this afternoon to talk about the new law variations that have just come into play because obviously they were played for the first time at the weekend in the New Zealand game. Mm -hmm. So we agreed that we'd just have a bit of a debrief uh, each week until the premiership starts just to talk about uh, how, how we can align so that when the premiership round one begins, they have a good understanding of how we interpret it and they've, been, they've had the opportunity to ask questions and we've learned quite a bit from them as well. So we have a good relationship, but they do have that opportunity to contact us pre-game. Um, which I think that is important as well. And the coaches are pretty good in the sense of they won't just contact us pre-game to put pressure on us. They'll be contacting us more about what our impression is. So they'll say, is there anything for, for us, Christoph? Is, have you seen anything that we need to improve on? And, and let's say sales, for example, rang me and I, that was the game they just played the week before that we've just looked at the clips at. Um, I would, I would then say, yeah, just a couple of things. I thought the breakdown was slightly untidy in the first 20 minutes of last week. Um, I just want you to make sure players aren't being taken out off the ball. Make sure your jacklers, particularly your, your good jacklers, are, are legal firstly in the gate. Make sure they stay on their feet and they make good choices because I don't want um, them taking, being desperate, taking risks. So anyway, in short, yes, we have those conversations, but they're productive. They're not... They're not there or designed to put pressure on us in any way. And what about after? after and the game? That, I was going to make that point. So that they do contact us after as well. Good, bad, indifferent. Um, nine times out of 10, they'll get in touch. They'll send productive clips um, and say, these are things we want clarity on. Uh, these are things we didn't quite understand. We'll respond. And that gets wrapped up on a Tuesday so that you can then refocus for the following game. And that's, that's agreed. You can know you, on a Tuesday, that's wrapped up. No more talk. Move on. Cool. Very handy relationship. Okay, doc. Christoph, a uh, quick question on follow-up to that then. Uh, in regards to that uh, uh, phone call you had with the DORs, uh, what, is the, um, what is the position in regards to the, the new law for basically the, the croc roll to the lower body protecting the uh, lower limbs? of the players what's so, what's your position with that so we we delivered it to the dors today and no one said anything and then right at the end um a couple of the coaches asked the question well what if we come and our first point of contact is the thigh or the knee um but we're driving it, are the knees and thighs completely out the question now can we drive and lift the leg or whatever and we've said we'll go and sleep seek more clarity but our current understanding is that you can still hit and drive and lift a leg. Obviously, you can't take someone above the horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, the ones we're trying to get is where players almost fail that initial clear out and then they croc roll them, but they put all that weight onto the joint or um, they're almost pulling them into the ground with them. And, and it, it's those nasty injuries we're trying to eliminate. And of course, yeah. almost all of them that we've seen is when the clearer fails the clear out and then has a second um, sort of bite at trying to yank him into the ground. And often that involves a twist. They're so, the ones I think we're going to end up refereeing. But uh, it's one of those things, it's still so new that th this will slightly change and it will evolve in the next few weeks. But it's, it's a fair question. Yeah. So more and more of the, the Jack Willis type incident. Definitely. And I think that's what provoked the, these changes. Is that was a big moment in, in, in I think, the 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 discussion for change yeah so as, as it stands right now then so going into clear uh and man, hooking that that knee uh, and lifting to the upper leg and driving through still okay my understanding is it is but we, we are looking for more clarity from world rugby as far as uh, as a sort of i'm concerned if, if a player clears out well on the first first occasion the, we don't get these scenarios every single example i've seen of, um, of players getting injured is when the player who's clearing him out failed or, or poorly cleared out the first time. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, so we're gonna get into a bit more contest now. So um, back into the Tigers-Bristol match uh, and there's some others along these lines as well. Uh, lots of contests that break down. 
let's have a look. I played this through a couple of times. And Dracula is rewarded. Just play that back slightly. Ball pops up unexpectedly. An early tackle from Dan Cole. Loose on the ground. And there's a million things going on there all at once. So there's no kind of complete the tackle as, as such. And we've got Jackler in on the ball. So I mentioned, but the ball carrier is trying to get long, but that's also what the defensive team want. And then we just got Dan Cole on the side. What's I think Dan, Dan Cole has been quite smart there again, I think, by driving. He's trying to create a wedge almost, or like a blocking line between them and his own Jackler. He's sort of been a bit smart and a bit cunning, really. Yeah, well, for, me, for me, for me, there's it's absolutely intentional to take yeah, yeah, away yeah. the opportunity to clear that ruck properly. Um, Christoph, what's your referee's perspective on this one? Com completely agree. Um, that, that again, you don't have that uh clear, clear space for attacking clearers to come and make a fair contest for that ball. Um, so I, I think this penalty probably goes the wrong way. Such a, I, when I saw this one, it was because it's such a random situation. Ball bounces really odd. Ball is being grabbed by two players at the same time. Dan Thomas may have the ball at that point in time. Dan Cole might think he's got the ball at that point. Uh, there's probably a point where he realizes he doesn't, however. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just it was the, it, that for me really highlighted the challenges uh, that players off the ball and on the ball have got. Um, but then really positive uh, Jack behaviour, uh, I thought getting shot on the ball. In terms of uh, kind of legality there, Christoph, what would you be looking at in terms of body angle as the, as the Jack led himself? Yeah, really happy with that Jackal position. And you look at the ball, ball carrier, he, he's not done a brilliant job there. Um, he's sort of ended up with the ball exactly where the Jackler would want it in that scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see him fighting to get back to his own side like I'm sure you guys would coach, but I might be wrong. Um, but that's a good Jackal position as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, interesting with the behaviours on the ground. It, it's almost the coach's behaviour is in contact, fall forwards, but he'd already kind of fallen and then still try to get forwards, uh, which was counteracted. I wonder whether that was just a... Uh, a negative transfer from the from the points uh, that they would have covered in contact. Um, and then just as the Jackler, uh, arms in tight. So uh, you guys might talk about uh, dinosaur hands uh, with, with the kids of so arms in tight. Well, the principle's the same at senior premiership level. Um, arm, arms in tight. Keep yourself nice and square on the contact area, feet well planted, and then uh, lock in arms on, onto the body with this one because the body's turned over. So lock arms onto the body and that, that pretty clearly demonstrates that the ball is, is is being held even though he might not be actually on the ball itself he's, he's pretty well onto the body which was uh which is pretty positive okay gets the penalty so look at a different uh, different example this is a this is a double uh, a double jackal by the way uh, this is this is the first one ball gets turned over one way Comes out. And the forward gets the ball on the other side of it. Take that back again. So picture-wise, you, you, Christoph, what kind of, do, to reward this jackal, what kind of things are you are you thinking of uh, that, that you'd want to be seeing? So cl clear release is the big thing I'd be looking at. So we talk about tick boxes here. So ball carrier isolated. Uh, I, I would probably say he's isolated there. So you've got yeah. ball carry isolated. So you've got, um, um, you've got balance of power now and defence favour. The white players on this side of the screen become desperate. They're all sort of coming in dubious angles because they're trying to work their way back into a position to clear. So I think this ticks all the boxes for that turnover. 
Um, and I think that's really well refereed to actually let them take the ball and play on. What what never feels right is when you you force a jackler to uh, play on and then give a penalty for holding the other way. Um, <laughs> it's just bad luck for a referee, and it's one of those that the coaches might go berserk about, but it's uh, it's understandable, I think. Mm-hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, so tackler as is given his second squeeze, but then uh, is is rolling away, so it makes it look nice and clean. And then again, eighteen months or so ago, uh, these guys coming in at forty five would have been all fine, but no longer. They got got to square up and come to the gate before they go. But then in uh, the question asked a moment ago about what they're aiming for, the legs are obviously are the big levers that jacklers are looking for, but. The uh, the clear is looking for rather the jackal is in such a good position. Um, if you see to your stuff, if you see knees on the body of the guy below, or how easy is that to spot? Or, or, or it, w- would that be something you'd look for? No, no, we just want his weight to be predominantly through his legs. And what I often say to players if I penalize them for off feet is I want you to be able to stand up with the ball. Um, Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a minimum standard. They should, if everyone moved out the way and they had nothing to lean on, they should be able to stand up cleanly with the ball. Um, So if if you were to remove everyone from the pitch frame here, do I think the Leicester player would still be standing up? Yes, I do. Um, It's when when he he would just fall flat on his face should you take everyone away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. That uh, that is a real nice uh, analogy. And I suppose what I uh, was worth doing now was, uh, although this is senior men's Premiership rugby, if we then think about our under twelves and the thirteens, there's some there's some things here that are exactly the same. There's some basic fundamentals that, that are exactly the same. Full wrap of the of arms with the, with the tackle, uh, ball carrier kind of under twelves, thirteens, fourteens. I I definitely be coaching about guys trying to really fight forwards in the, in the contact area, which Marlins is doing in this instance. I'd be definitely coaching. Jacklers getting low as they get around the corner. So rather than getting back and getting chest high, stays low, feet both around, dug heels into the ground, all, all, or all six studs, so the, the, the front studs uh, stuck, in, stuck into the ground and then lock, locks onto the ball. I'd... I'd coach exactly the same principles to my yeah, under, under 13s, under 14 players. Um, and I'd also be talking to the cleaners about finding levers, finding backs and knees, finding loose arms to, to, to clear out. Uh, and then the ball goes through. So just in terms of a forward year, Christoph. So tackle made. So if you if you pause it straight when he first splashes on that ball there, so just through a few through a few foot, I I don't think that's a good picture, um, and especially after you've just you've just asked so much of that Leicester Jackler who's done everything right, you've you've not given him not given him the holding on penalty, you've actually forced him to play away. And then you get this picture where his head's almost on the ground. And if we go to that analogy, if we remove the player on the ground, would a foe actually stand up? I don't think so. Um, I think he would tilt forward onto his head. Um, so I do think this is a different picture to the one we saw a few seconds ago. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then just coaching points wise for the clearer. Um, a lot of coaching, I see uh, Ruck. Wise looks like going through the arms and, and kind of punching holes through the window, whereas actually most effective clears, I think, try and find a bit of an angle on it, so rather than it being like a scrum impact, it's like an illegal scrum in- impact where you uh, you try and find a small angle and then try and find some le- levers to, to get the clear um, and does pretty well to kind of get a battle with, with a forward, but he's obviously already on the ball. Any questions or any of that, um, coaches, before I go into the next one? He almost, the clear almost aids the jackler there, doesn't he? He almost puts him into a better position. Yeah, absolutely uh, does. You, you wonder whether it would almost be better pulling him off his feet um, once he first goes on the ball, but it, I know it's not in the instinct mm-hmm. as the players to do that. How would, you, how would you view that? Because again, different referees interpret that one differently. Or stuff. I, I would say he's pulled him over, but because of the position he put himself in in the first place, mm-hmm. uh, to me that would be tit for tat. So I, I wouldn't penalise him for off feet, 
Mm. But I, I would certainly be talking that ball out there. Um, but I think the best case scenario would be would be making sure Leicester still have the ball here and, it, and we just play through it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, okay, so slightly different scenario. So uh, Munson, just a little bit of pressure. And the things that stood out for me were then the actions of the nearest supporting Munster players. Who are renowned for being highly effective ruck clearers. So target areas, um, kind of what kind of pictures are you, are you looking for there? So jacklers in or the kind of semi illegal jackler is is it is in and over the ball. What kind of things are you looking for there, Christoph, in terms of legality with the nearest so, uh, support I, player? I don't think the jackler has a right to the ball there. If you go back slightly, he's on his right knee, um, so so he's actually on the ground when he first so stop there. He's on the, he's on the ground when he first attacks the ball. Mm -hmm. So I'd I'd be calling him off. Um, the first clear is really good. I don't think you can penalise the second clearer because he almost latches on alongside the, the, the legal clearer. And that's where there's a bit of a grey area because he, he's almost a latcher to his own clearer as opposed to an entering in his own entity, if that makes sense. And this is where the game becomes a bit more of a science. Is It's, it's grey, really, this, this part, because he's just alongside as opposed to coming in at a different angle. What do we think, coaches? Come on, put your money uh, on the table, coaches. Legal or not legal? I, legal. I, I, which which part is legal? I, I, I agree with Christoph that the uh, the jackler uh, is illegal with his knee on the ground. He, mm -hmm. he has no right to that ball. What about next supporting player? Well, so... My, my my worry there is when where where does the the uh, the safety factor for the players come in? I mean, is he is he binding or is he is he reaching out and touching and uh, before full contact or is it just shoulder on to back, which again is not head or shoulders. Um, he's almost I should be hooking that leg to probably help out. I'd say the legal. Well, it, it was it was allowed, um, yeah. and I think the I mean things that we coach to coach the kids are probably going to be slightly different. I, I think in terms of where, where our target area there, I mean that's that's directly down on kind of the top of shoulders, which I know the senior senior level is just a part of the, of the rock area, I suppose. But with junior kids, probably I, I, I'm certainly more mindful of these kind of clears. I, I'm encouraging them to find angles, to find levers, uh, find softer bits rather than go in, in there um, with, uh, with with younger kids. Too. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't really touch upon that that bit about where, we, where we're making contacts on clear outs. This is certainly a, a massively evolving and, and changing part of our game where we now need clearers to be aware of what they're clearing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the word that comes to mind is control. So we're bringing back control to the clear. And so with control means players need to be closer. They need to make sure that they, they don't find their ball carrier isolated because that's where we get those, what I would call out of control, reckless challenges where they don't know what they're going to hit. They're just going to hit it. And then it, it's Russian roulette really because whether they hit a shoulder, a back, or a head, it is pure luck when they, when they find themselves charging 100 mile an hour and launching at the breakdown. So we, we do need players to make better choices now and, and to be in more control than they were a few years ago. Thank you. That's what separates us from American football. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, that went through again in a moment. So uh, this... Again, kind of with my coach's head on, I'm thinking this would be this would be the practice. I, I would literally run it six versus six, couple of groups of three, uh, and then get help players get good at these type of offensive situations where you can be caught behind the game line, rather than it all being really sanitary. Um, and I do this with again with the younger kids as well as much older kids, otherwise known as adults, uh, but they get used to kind of behind the game line, in front of the game line. So, 
pictures where you're been you've been taken out of the game as a as a support player and have to work your way back around. So there, I, I was interested in particularly with with support tackler, kind of how much you can do in there, Christoph. If if you don't go for the ball, kind of how much how much you can do to be a pain without you uh, becoming illegal. You can't do that. That's for sure. Um, are you talking about? Uh, sorry, let's just watch it through. So. Yeah. And ends up in the middle of. Uh, of the Sorry, road. I'm I'm actually looking at the red three there, um, so I'm very conscious of where red three ends up here. But he's yeah. actually trying to clear a player, isn't he? Um, he is, and he's, he kind of slips off his back. It, it's generally a pretty messy breakdown. There's players on the ground. There's players tripping over other players. There's a two pulling players through the rook. Um, as a referee, you're also thinking about that box kick that's about to happen and whether the charge down is onside. That, that's a really tricky picture for a ref. And, and this is where I think you get your more random decisions from referees. And I, I, I almost want to, because as coaches here, I'll put the pressure back on you guys. I feel like, is there not enough numbers in, in, into this breakdown? Um, is that why the breakdown is loose? Because there's no guards protecting the kicker. Could he have easily been charged down? Um, is this gold standard in terms of what you'd want your players to do in terms of protection and um, of the nine and, and protection of the ball? You, you guys tell me. I, I'm not sure, but um, is that what plays a factor in the messiness of the breakdown? What is your thoughts? Uh, you see the 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 pod is set. The three man pod is good. The the um, the defensive line is set. The contact is made at or just uh, before the gain line. I mean, it's a good contest there. Then it gets sloppy as we hit the ground. Um, Leinster's folding around to set the next phase. Um, Blue scrum cap here comes in to help set the uh, set the ruck, and and uh, then sorry, who's the uh, who's the scrummy there? Is that um, the Irish lad? Uh, Connor Murray. Thank, thank you, Connor Murray. Um, he, I think he's just too quick in, in moving that ball out because you see the uh, the other players are coming in to set the caterpillar, and he just wants to move that ball. So I mean, yeah, it's a bit sloppy to me. No real uh foul play of any sort that would be worthy of a of a call here comes the blocker late now um i think connor munnery just uh rushed that a little bit but i mean other than that that's uh yeah but, uh, uh, all, just give you all a, the pieces were set yeah sure go on to give you a uh clue in this one with, with months the months that don't play long caterpillars generally they'll play with a with a blocker there which is the nfl style of uh, kick protection so rather than get an extra player there they'd put him outside and Murray would then step or oh, clip that one too short uh, he'd step outside of him um, what uh, I suppose one of the things that really stands out for me is just how offensive the tackle is so good initial hit six then six really makes this difficult for these players to get a good clean on because he's taking the uh, ball carrier stand there he's taking him away from his support and then just, a, I think he just does a good job of just being in the way uh, and they can't ignore him. Bounces straight back to his feet. Uh, he's, I don't think he's doing anything illegal. I think he's just being a pain, which is exactly what I asked my players to do. Get back up on your feet. If you're not going to go for the ball, if, as long as you're legal and you're on the right side of the wreck, just be a pain. Make yourself, uh, make yourself somebody that they've got to remove, um, even though he's never going to get on the ball. And that's committed then extra numbers. Uh, and then this is one of the things that stands up for me is guys at the back of Rooks. And we see this at uh, the top level of the game. Um, them showing a, a, a tag burn at the back, showing a positive picture. So everybody else is on the floor, but the guy at the back of the Rooks doing his best as he possibly can to show a positive picture, which uh, I don't know if that influences referee decision making, Christoph, but when you kind we, of you see we, that. We saw two decisions at the weekend in the Lions game where the players at the back of the rock didn't weren't fully bound. And so they were the, the, the referee called the ball out and South Africans came around and attacked the ball. And 
by all accounts, it looked like the ball was never out, but but it, but on a technicality, it was because he wasn't fully bound. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that is, again, something that we might have to adjust to and might start coming into the game where we ask more of these players. They've yeah. got to be properly bound, not just a hand on, not just a, a wrist connected, but actual shoulders on. Um, I think this is something we're going to be encouraging more, certainly at our level. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting that the ball was out because the South Africans had pulled the guys who were on their feet, had pulled them off their feet. And that moved it forwards and, and the ball came out. Lots of things to look at. Uh, right, next next example. So players, I, I played, there's a few phases in this one. I played that one just again so you can see just some of the, see the small shove just before. So just in, just in contact gives him a, an acceleration push. So we, then, we so, sorry, we, we discussed this a few months ago after an incident in a Leicester game uh, where we ended up carding. So if you look, that makes contact with the head. So the Munster player actually hits him in the head with the left shoulder, if you watch. Yeah. So we saw that in a Leicester game and we ended up sending off the tackler. What we said on review and moving forwards is even if that red player smashes him in the head, we would the penalty would be against Blue for mm. pushing his player into the contact area because he's the one who accelerated the collision. He's the one. Um, it, essentially, we said we wouldn't allow players to be pushed into a contact. So um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a player against a penalty against the Blue player. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, so acceleration first, and then we've got uh, tackling the tackler. So tacklers there, get him off the ball quickly by even before tackle completion, get him off the ball. And then I'll just play this couple of next couple of through. Let me just play that again. A few things to look at there. Yeah. Omani doing what Omani does, getting the ball back. So, look at uh, players on the ball, players off the ball. Tackler, first step. If your second squeeze, definitely takes slightly more than a second. Uh, and then players off the ball. And then through. What are you thinking, Christophe? Um, I'm interested to know what, from a coach's perspective, what what would what do you think about this clip? Uh, is there anything that concerns you guys, or are we just at play on? I think Leinster obviously went in with like a two man pod, so left himself short, and then seven. I don't know what number he is, but the red just steps away. So eight is it eight or the guy there? on the floor we're just cleaning out now I suppose he's just trying to clear out the tackler the assist tackler but the assist tackler steps away so I think that's just play on I could be wrong but completely agree Um, he's just you you would always expect that player to contest and he steps off and and the blue player just falls into the space so the again these aren't off feet we're going after and you'll hear referees in the professional games say you stepped off I think you would have heard that a couple of times. Uh, and then just so, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so stepped away, uh, tackler's given a bit of a squeeze and then just notice him lifting legs after, just trying to disrupt the ball by, uh, by being sneaky in there. And that's, that's 100% a coach behavior. Um, if, if that caused disruption, Christoph, would, would you penalize them like that? Or would, um, if, would he that be up, if he stands up in the... Uh, so, for example, if if the nine gets caught here uh, with the ball, if he gets caught at the base, I, I mean, he's offside, firstly, and he makes his tackle. So, actually, I would be penalising him because he, he's on the ground, he's out the game, he launches from his knee uh, and gets straight back into the game. So, actually, he, he, he's, he does get back to his feet, but he's offside, isn't he? Um, so, 
that you, you, you are, again, it comes back to your players making good choices. Um, four minutes in, you, you'd take the risk, wouldn't you? Of course, if this was the last play of the game and you were uh, two points up, would you be encouraging your players to do this? I, I think it would be really risky. Mm-hmm. What about the actions of uh, Red Six as you've got one low, one high? He goes in on the ball. That's clearly over the top of the shoulder. Is he putting himself in a position there where he shouldn't be putting it in? So just as he as the ball carrier goes into the contact. His hand is on his shoulder. You mean, uh, Chris? Keep going. Back a little bit more, mate. Back a little bit more. Uh, so I think it's that Pete, uh, um, Red, and keep, Amani, going, yeah. keep, Amani, keep going back to the original tackle. So the tackle in here, he comes in with the swinging arm. He comes around that corner, bang. Oh, there, yeah. There. Is that, I mean, I guess he's locking on to the ball, but if we saw a 13 tackling a winger with that chop over the top with the seatbelt, is he putting himself in a place of... So, so we, we see this sort of collision a lot on the pick and goes. So yeah. when you get pick and goes around the goal line, we're always seeing players uh, with arms over the shoulders like this underneath. So I do think some responsibility has to go back to the ball carrier here. You know, the ball carrier is bent 90 degrees, uh, falling into the ground. Uh, Omani's never going to go over the top of his back there. Um, he's always going to try clamp underneath and either hold him up or try uh, tear that ball out of his grasp. So I think we, we have to accept that um, th- this we're, we will get these scenarios. Um, the ones we're going after is where more in open play when the player's got a clear line of sight and ends up over the shoulder uh, and there's nothing to justify why, why you'd end up in that position. Um, but this just to me seems like the dynamics of the of the t- of when the game is close yeah. in close proximity, and, and I just think we see a lot of those on the pick and goes. And I think the play, the lack of player reaction, tells you a lot about those ones. They'll they'll definitely let you know if they get smashed in the head, especially in the current climate. Cool. Should be quick to tell you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Last couple of examples. So uh, this one stood out first up for me, just as a uh, a tackler making a making a pretty effective attack uh, tackle, and then just doing everything he can to be legal and um, to get back on the on, the, on his own side. Do, do you see anything different there, uh, Christoph? That's that's gold standards for me. That that's as good as it gets. Cool. Because uh, uh, yeah, I was I was thinking like, would this be a play I should show my uh, a clip should show my players rather. Uh, and when I saw it, I was thinking, well, he's he's obviously had an influence on yeah. another player as he's flown over the top. But then I kind of thought, well, that's his fault, surely. Um, the qual- kind of... the quality of the ball is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. And then the hands on floor. This is something that's changed significantly in the last uh, probably six months or so. Uh, Jack um, supporting players going actively on the floor with their hands rather than on the bodies. Uh, uh, it, it, has that been a discussion, Christoph? It, it doesn't make a difference, really, whether floor on, hands on floor, hands on bodies, that, that they're going to put their hands on the ground. Sometimes it's whether they are, again, s- stopping a realistic contest. They're the ones we need to get. Um, if, if we go after every single one, there'll be too many penalties. So the question from coaches is, well, how can we get the ones that matter and be consistent with it? And we, we've agreed the ones we go for are the guys that, put their hands on the floor in order to negate a contest that would have clearly been there had he not have put himself in that position. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, and then there's fears straight after. We then get one of these really awkward clean out scenarios. So tackler, pretty strong in the contact, released. And an attempted uh, attempted twist after. So, so that's the scenario where he fails that first. He fails. So that if he'd rolled in there, crop rolled in there, it's fair game. Once he fails here, 
he you've got to give up there. He's lost that contest, that initial clear. So if he then twists whilst he's on the ground, weight bearing onto the joint, these are the ones that World Rugby are trying to get rid of because this now becomes dangerous. Um, he gets saved because 12 red actually puts back his right foot if you go a few frames forward. Yeah, yeah. So he repositions himself. But if he doesn't, I think that's where you're getting those Jack Willis scenarios. Yeah, I saw it and it literally said the shudder down my spine when I saw this one. Um, it's, it is so close it's to so being close. horrendous. And, and that's a hundred and that's a 125 kg prop uh, pulling away at a 95 kg centre. So that, that, that's, you know, these are the ones that are going to cause serious issues. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. And then uh, it, slightly uh, more wild scenario. Uh, and this one, again, kind of the up on feet bit would be, be interesting to discuss on this one. Okay, so, so we spoke about, loads of pressure. I mentioned a load of triggers earlier that I used. Um, this ticks one of the boxes I mentioned earlier, um, which is overrunning, um, where they come and take a shortcut and seal. And so my, I would have had heightened awareness immediately the moment he overruns. So if you go back slightly, he overruns the attacker, 15 ends up in front. He then realizes there's a threat and he seals with a shortcut. So that ticks the boxes for me. This is a pet should be a penalty for sealing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. It, it looked highly illegal. Um, it wasn't penalized on, on this occasion. I play the next bit. I think that's where, um, that um, one is. I, I, sorry, that's where his coach is as well. I, I can understand why that's not penalized because the jackler doesn't actually the jackler almost gives that gives up too easily. He doesn't look to be co trying as very hard to compete. 14 mm -hmm. almost accepts, um, accepts his fate of having never got that ball. I think that your best jacklers in the world, you know, your, your uh, Hamish Watson's, your uh, Tom Curry's, they're going to let you know that he's just stopped them stealing the ball. Um, so that, that's a good message for you, sort of your more experienced players is, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we get these clear pictures from the opposition, we, we've got to make sure the referee's aware that we are trying to contest. Otherwise, he might just, he might just move on. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. That, that's, that's a real, real valid point with, um, with Keith Hills. He kind of checks in, but then gives up pretty quickly, doesn't he? Yeah, so stay in that fight. And then final one, which does end up in a penalty to Leinster. And it ends up as a penalty because of the tackler enabling the jackal. So Tagburn comes in and over the ball, gets in pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think we can probably we probably all agree with this one that that there is you, there's no clear runway for the attacking clearers to enter there and be effective. And again, I I know I keep mentioning choice, but. That the jackler that comes in for Munster here, he he should see his players on the wrong side, um, and, and he takes the risk there by going onto the ball. And if I if I was to go coach a team now, I'd be saying, look, lads, you it's not just about trying to poach every single ball we can. If if the players are on the wrong side, you've got to leave the ball alone and and just and and wait for you almost wait for your moment. So I don't, I wouldn't want my flankers just turning up to every breakdown, trying to steal the ball. I, I need better awareness here from, from my players to say, look, there's two guys clearly on the wrong side. We're never going to get reward here. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've been into clubs and, and I think they do coach that or you get other players who, who call their own flanker off. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly positive behaviour when your own players are helping you to make those good decisions. Um, and then just kind of, as was from another coach perspective, uh, outside player uh, literally he falls over the falls over the area, doesn't he? Um, puts his face down to the ground pretty quickly. Probably can't see a great deal of that tackle. Kind of eyes up would have potentially helped him a little, and then just loses balance and gets over, uh, and that is game over at that point. Penalty awarded. Right, everybody, we've gone through a, a load of examples. Um, 
the opportunity for you for kind of in the next few minutes. If you've got any particular questions for Christoph or anything you're particularly interested in, then uh, this is your opportunity. Uh, the only one I got is regarding sort of community rugby. You know the new law variations, are they coming down to community yeah. rugby as well? Yeah, Ace all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering because I haven't heard much about it in like from the RFU. So, okay, um, I thank you. Think, I think you, they'll be really... Uh, so we only discussed it for the first time today. Cool. Um, so what tends to happen is you'll get an agreement from the sort of professional board and then they'll drip feed that. Um, and hopefully we... Hopefully they'll will be ready for the season. Cool, thank you. So, as a follow up to that, then, so one of the other ones is about the the latching player having to stay on his feet. So, is he basically going to have to let go as the as the tackle player goes to deck? Are you happy with him sort of hitting the deck and bouncing immediately back up? So it doesn't quite say it doesn't quite say he has to stay on his feet. It says he has to make an effort to get back to his feet. Right. Um, so that latching player can go to ground with the sort of natural dynamic of that tackle, um, but he has to be seen to be making an effort to get back to his feet. Um, so what you can't have is just pure ceiling and then just staying there. Uh, he, yeah, he's got to make a conscious effort to jump back up. Perfect, thanks. With the dropout from underneath the sticks, how far has that got to go? Five metres. Five, cool. Yeah, but I think teams will be crazy to kick at the five metres. But we'll see. <laughs> we played it Saturday. We played uh, we played Newcastle Saturday. Uh, and it was it was goal line dropout um, and 50-22. We had four goal line dropouts. And it was very... It's like the kick-out game that we uh, probably every coach plays. Uh, it's, it's essentially kick-out. Yeah, yeah. Although I think you're going to get some scenarios where... Um, like you'll get a held up because it does say that they have to take it they can take it immediately so you'll get a held up there'll be 10 bodies on the floor you'll get a faf de clerk grab the ball run 60 meters 50 meters up the other width of the pitch and take a quick one and they'll disappear off of the pitch um or, or the wingers will be prepared and they'll stand really really wide on the touch line um, and they will take a shorter goal line dropout. I, I, so I, I don't think it, it's as Chris, I, th I actually think they probably might kick it five metres at some point if they get the opportunity to go quickly with players still out the game. Um, but they, you can do that. So from coach's point of view, that's an interesting tactic, getting that ball back as quick as you can and actually using um, that sort of dead time to, to, to get on with the game. Think quick. Uh, Rich, your hand is up. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. I thought we started at half eight. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back to the um, the fifty twenty, because like in league we don't do the forty twenty in the amateur game because we've got no professional assistant refs. <laughs> um, so I mean, is that I don't I mean I, I don't know. I I kind of feel like it's going to happen for about six months and then. And then someone might think of that, but is that something you guys have discussed? It, or is... It, it, isn't it the same as the twenty-two? Um, yeah, no, but I think that, I think that I think the issue. I mean, you could do it, but they don't. But I think the issue is obviously one person's watching where you're kicking from, the other person's watching where it goes out. But yeah, we just don't in in rugby league. We just don't do it unless you've got yeah. assistant refs or actual refs as well. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, I think. What we've likened it to virtually exactly the same as the 22. So um, we, we'll sort of always be aware, right? They're inside the 22. They can kick out on the full or yeah. they're inside their own half. They can kick, kick out into the opposition 22. It, it just, the ref's just going to have to work a bit harder. But you're right. It's going to bring some challenges to the community game because one of you will be coaching a team that will take it back, kick it into the 22, and you'll get the line out when you shouldn't. One of you will be coaching a team that the opposition kick it in the in your half and still get the line out, so it will go wrong. Um, okay, it's just, I, but I don't. I think they'll run the the same laws sort of nationally, just because they always have in, in union anyway. Cool. Cheers. 
Cool. Right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Christoph. Uh, we've gone well, through uh, a lot of ground there. So, uh, yeah, massive thank you for, uh, for giving your insight. It's been really, really useful. Uh, definitely some thoughts that are going through my mind with that as well. Um, coaches, thank you all for logging on. Always good to have people on live. Uh, I always adds a little bit more to it. Um, recording will go on course logic as ever so you'll be able to log into that at some point this evening if you want to catch up and then those of you who are catching up uh via course logic only uh, i hope you've enjoyed it um, and i will say good night to you all there everybody uh our next one by the way is uh an snc based webinar which will be in september uh, which looks at how snc can be brought in across the age groups and across the levels um, even if you train twice a week. Um, so we'll try and cover some of those themes as well. See you soon, everybody. Thank you.